This was a hard video for me to make. I basically stared at the blank script for this one for months while working on the scumbox, trying to figure out a good starter. I actually thought about doing this video unscripted because I felt I would get a more raw representation of my emotions for this series. But after multiple conversations with my partner, I realized I couldn't manage to stay on topic in a digestible manner. Also, talking to myself while reading a script feels less unhinged than ranting about Pat Labor unscripted. Pat Labor to me is like an uncle you haven't seen in years, that you know you loved as a kid, but it's been so long that you kind of forgot about why you loved him. But then one day he shows up at the family reunion, tells you the dumbest joke you've ever heard, and asks you how you've been, and the memories just all come flooding back to you. This was my first manga I ever read and came to me at a very upsetting time in my life. So it tends to mean a lot to me. So I guess this video is kind of a retrospective, but also me kind of looking at Pat Labor in a more analytical light than I would have as a kid or on a casual rewatch. And not in my usual way of looking at the show, but also in a way where I'm just info dumping on one of my favorite shows while telling you to watch it and while also telling you about its history. Pat Labor is a strange beast to say the least. Its staff was pretty star-studded at the time, but all of them were pretty low on the totem pole. It was made by a group of people called Headgear, and this group consisted of Masami Yuki, whose manga works range from The Mighty Birdie to Mobile Police Pat Labor, Yutaka Izabuchi, who's famous for designing characters, specifically robots for things like Pat Labor, Gundam, Reza Fan, Urika 7, Kamen Rider, and several Sentai series, Kazunori Ito, a screenwriter who did writing for things like Dirty Pear, Ghost in the Shell, and Gamera. Akemi Takata, she's a character designer who did designs for shows like the cursed Creamy Mommy and millions of other things that I don't want to try to pronounce. And finally, Mamoru Oshi, who directed a few things like uh, Urusei Yatsura, Angel's Egg, Ghost in the Shell, you know, some of the biggest artsy fartsy shit in anime. No big deal! Together they formed the Megazord of Headgear and began making Pat Labor across several media platforms. I actually thought this followed the basic manga to anime pipeline, but but from my understanding, it was a whole multimedia experience. The manga and early days OVA both came out in 1988, while the TV series and the first movie came out in 1989. The second movie came out in 1993, and finally, the third movie came out in 2001. Anyways, we're here to talk about the stuff I pretty much grew up with, which will be our starting point here and your starting point if you decide to watch the series. A small craft has entered the security zone. Oh, that's him! It 
name was the genius engineer Shigeo Shiba, the pride of the SV-2. And the dimly glowing object he held resolutely in his arms. It almost looked like a... the intention of the devil. A dissolved oxygen destroying device! An oxygen destroyer! What? Pat Labor is a strange series. It's an amalgamation of genres, but overall most media you see about it will classify as science fiction. It's about a future where Japan is trying to build a series of megastructures to help reclaim land lost to global warming and build homes for an ever-growing Japanese population. The latter of which being wishful thing. To build these megastructures, they build labors, which are giant construction robots. But with big robots came big crime. To fight this, Japan made the special vehicles divisions and equipped them with special labors built to fight labor crime called patrol labors or pat labors. Oh, so that's where it came from. The first OVA, usually called Pat Labor the Early Days, is what most people consider to be their favorite piece of media in the franchise, along with the movies. In the first episode, we're introduced to our excellent cast of characters. Asuma Shinohara, the himbo slacker who only joined the mobile police force because his father made him. Hiromi Yamazaki, the gentle giant son of a fisherman who loves all animals big or small. Isao Ota, the living embodiment of a Napoleon complex. He loves guns and is a top-notch pilot. I originally didn't like him as much as I like the other characters, but after rewatching the show, I realized my favorite episodes are the ones where Ota gets to be something other than an insane gun nut. He generally has some great character development. Kanoko Clancy, a character everyone is horny for. She's a temporary member in their division. She's a third generation Hawaiian immigrant, works for NYPD, and she's often the professional voice of reason. She's a great pilot, but because she's temporary, she runs the command car for Ota instead of being a forward. Ikiyasu Shinshi, he's a very quiet, married man who is very devoted to making his wife happy, but also has a very hot temper. In multiple instances, we actually see him lose his grip for a moment, and he can be more threatening than the actual gun nut Napoleon complex of Ota. Captain Kichi Goto, the world's most exhausted man. Please just let him rest. He has to constantly rein in all of these team members like baby ducks, while also helping every single one of them with their personal problems. He also has a mysterious past and is hinting at having some absolutely hidden badass talent. Captain Shinobu Naguma. Captain Shinobu Nagumo. Captain Shinobu Nagumo. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Shinobu Nagumo. We did it, folks. The captain of SV-1, which has no shown members in the first OVA. Nagumo is a great foil for Goto. When he appears to be lazy, she's always hardworking. In reality, she understands and knows Goto well enough to know he's not lazy, he's just calculating something quietly. They always have a slight will-they-won't-they -they relationship throughout the series. Finally, Noah Azumi. She's the only permanent female member of SV-2 in the OVAs and movies, and is also just perfect. I am... Um in the middle of editing this video right now and i feel like i just needed to come in here with a little note uh i'm doing this bit where there's a bunch of just cute pictures of noah coming up on screen and i was like huh i wonder where these all can't come from turns out there's just a book of of like illustrations from new type that's called noah izumi photographs live and I need this book. This sounds like the cutest fucking thing in the world. Anyways, that's all I wanted to say. Like, she's the definition of the tomboy. She loves labors, animals, and sports. She's an amazing pilot, probably bisexual, could drink you under the table, and a bit of an idiot. Most pat labor media you will consume will probably focus on this cast, give or take a few characters. The OVA mainly focuses on them though, so we're mostly going to talk about that right now. The first episode of the OVA introduces us to the characters in very simple but very telling ways. A group of four new recruits is stepping off of the bus, and after some chatter between the engineering staff and the captains of the divisions, uh, we notice that right off the bat, Asuma is making half-joke remarks about the maintenance crew. Uh, Ota is already threatening to shoot someone, Hiromi is nervous, Shinji is the quiet guy, and Goto is too lazy to come down and meet his new staff. Uh, hold on. We're missing someone. Where's... There she is! Her intro in 
both of the major continuities is absolutely perfect for her character. She comes in late on her moped and instantly salutes. She's sloppy, but still trying her best to be professional. She's not even in fucking uniform at this point. While we're being introduced to our main gang of goons though, there's been talk that along with the new rookies, Division 2 is also getting brand new labors, upgrading their bulky Neanderthal-like Type 96 Oscars to something more high-tech. All right, let's have a little sideline about labors, because just like any mecha show, they're my favorite part and also just the coolest part of the show. The labors were built to assist in construction of the Babylon Project. We understand that and we know that, but I just want to talk about the clear technological evolution taking place in this show. Pat labor is taking place in the late 20th century, 10 years in the future from when it was originally written. In the 10 years between 1987 and 1997, Japan was in this huge economic bubble with no end in sight. So speculative people began thinking of what crazy technology would emerge. Computers were getting pretty insane, so it's no wonder people really thought technology was just gonna fucking blow up out of nowhere. So people's minds began to run a little crazy when it came to speculative fiction. And yeah, Pat Labor isn't that bad with this. I mean, yeah, there's giant robots, but just hear me out for a sec. Technology in the series is so analog and grounded, like MP3s didn't make CDs or cassettes just magically disappear. We still have those things, and a lot of us still use them. This weird in-between growing pains pre-cyberpunkism, where technology is on the verge of being really sleek and nice, but also still analog and heavy, is none more apparent than in the mechs of the show. You have these bulky pieces of basically construction equipment with legs that are still more machine than computer versus practically walking supercomputers that have very basic artificial intelligence but still hyper advanced for the time. Which is another reason I absolutely love the cast of this show, which I'll explain more in a second. Keep that thought in the back of your mind though, we'll circle back around to it. In the first episode of this first OVA, we know two big things have happened so far. The new guys are here, and they have newer labors coming in to replace their bulk machines. These top of the line, high tech sleeker labors, the AV-98 Ingrams, which are basically just the face of Pat Labor. They become the logo, everything. Uh, and the clear evolution of tech here is something I love. The look of the machines, the upgraded internal computers, the way they went from gas powered to electric, which isn't even talked about it, but you can tell that they're not gas powered by the sounds of their engines. I love it, it's great stuff. You can actually hear the diesel chugging through some of the older machines but you hear the electrical engines it's great it's an amazing detail in the show And this is where we're shown Pat Labor's biggest and major theme is present in a lot of its DNA the world for better or for worse changes which this this is going to sound crazy but this makes this series feel a little bit like a vent piece for the members of Headgear. Something I found out while researching for this video was that most of the members of Headgear were in their 30s or younger, Oshi being only 36, which compared to the other big name anime directors he trained under was young. The big reason I say this feels like a little bit of a vent piece is a lot of members of Headgear trained under old guards in the anime industry. They were rookies, barely trained for this new and quickly changing world. Do you understand what I'm trying to say here yet? This might be why Pat Labor's character writing shines through so much when you watch this show, to the point where even the most unlikable characters have these genuine and gorgeously written moments of catharsis, because these were people making art about their experiences in their industry. Again, I, this could sound crazy and I could be talking out of my ass, but once you think of the show like this, you start to draw comparisons to the headgear members and the characters on the show. Technology in real life was going fucking insane too. CGI, high quality audio, laser disc, VHS. People were just now starting to own actual copies of anime. They could watch whenever they feel like it or play video games based on those weird anime. 
Pat Labor, the TV series, is the perfect showcase of this era in anime history. They paid for a CGI model of the Ingram at the beginning of every episode that shows off the in-canon specs of it. And boy fucking howdy, were they gonna use it? People don't like the TV show as much as the early days OVA because it's a lot more slapsticky and comedy-centric compared to the original OVA. In my opinion, though, it has some of the best character moments of the franchise. Every character in our main cast has an entire episode or two devoted to developing a major characteristic around them. The first episode does the same thing the OVAs did, and that was to introduce us to the characters in their own special ways. We learn Ota is a hot-headed military man, Asuma is the annoyed slacker, Hitomi is the quiet giant, Shinji is the overworked nerd. Wait, wait, where'd she go? She, uh, uh, wait, dude, uh, oh. Yes! Oh, good, so good, I did it twice! Everyone you will talk to who loves this show will instantly tell you how comfy it is. It is like a bag of kettle cooked sour cream and onion potato chips. It's the perfect amount of each of its characteristics and you could probably start putting away entire bags of episodes if left unchecked by friends and family. This is a very pleasant change of pace for me honestly. Nowadays, one season of anime is 12 episodes long. There's not a whole lot of time for the anime to slow down and relax, letting you enjoy the characters and their motivations. Pat Labor on TV has 48 episodes, as well as a sequel OVA that's 16 episodes, which means it has time to not only have its Monster of the Week robot battles, but also slow down and give time to smaller, more character-centric episodes. This honestly feels so refreshing and makes me more comfortable binging this show, like I have over 60 plus episodes of a show to watch and not just a meager 12? That's great! It's also not ungodly long either. It's not 900 plus episodes with a good chunk of that being a plot unrelated filler. I'm not gonna say the name of it, you know what show I'm talking about. This is due to the unique circumstances that made the show, but I digress. One great example of how comfy the show can get is this episode where Noah is going around asking every single person who works at their shop what they want for lunch. This gives up these great moments of characterization where we're introduced to a bunch of different mechanics with different personalities. Or the episodes that surround Ota. He's my least favorite character, but his character episodes are so sweet and human, they're definitely some of my favorites. I have a personal bias to the design of this show though. I grew up watching a lot of cartoons and shows having an overarching plot, but Monster of the Week episodes were my favorites. Action cartoons like Samurai Jack, My Life as a Teenage Robot, Teen Titans, Megas XLR, Rest in Peace, were some of the best best to me. An anime with basically that kind of layout, that's fantastic to me. But I think my favorite thing about the overall IP of Pat Labor is that through each iteration of it is how it treats its characters as human beings and how real all of it can be from time to time. Even the TV series, which is more comedy than drama like the other iterations, has these palpable serious moments of emotion. Like when Ota has amnesia and can't remember he has such a hot temper, but still does what he can to help people in emergencies because deep down inside, he is still instinctually a good person. Or when Hiromi finds out that there's a whale stuck in Tokyo Bay that won't leave, and he does everything in his power to help because as a child, he watched the whales with his father. Or the countless, countless episodes about Noah where we learn why she humanizes labor so much is because they remind her of her pets when she was a kid, or the ones where they hint that she's probably some shade of bisexual. Great stuff, by the way. What do you mean by that? Also, that whale episode just has a cameo from Superman? Oh, yeah, the Easter eggs, references, and parodies in this show are fucking on point. You can definitely tell a bunch of fucking nerds made this show. There's literally like four episodes where they try to just see how many movie references they can fit into the 20 minute runtime. Two of them take place in the United States. There's even a scene in a video store where they put the names of actual movies they had seen on the spines of the tapes. This episode is also the one where they turn the entire cast away, except for Hiromi, who's racist. On a lighter note, here's some gun colored labors. What was I talking about? Oh yeah, character-driven episodes. This series is a pre-Evangelion mecha anime, meaning that emotional character-driven episodes aren't as big and emotional as they should be. No crazy allegories, no bizarre imagery that requires explanation, no overtly dark tones, no... Oh no. Oh no.
Yeah, uh, the first movie lets you know it isn't fucking around right away. The very first scene we get is this creepy ass scene that scared the hell out of me as a kid. The show and OVAs, which I watched first as a kid, were so much more comedy than serious thriller. In my honest opinion, the strange and famous usage of existentialism in Japanese media that spawned things like Evangelion, Ghost in the Shell, and the Pat Labor movies as well, seemed to possibly be a direct or indirect effect of the economic bubble bursting. The first movie is the most Pat Labor of the three. It has the comedy of the show, but it also has this constant political thriller tension that was present in the first OVA. Which makes sense, the first OVA was part of the same continuity as the films. The first one is my favorite to be honest. It's about a programmer who worked for Shinohara Heavy Industries, purposefully implanting a bug in the program that makes laborers in computer systems just shut down and go berserk. This honestly was right up my alley. I absolutely love technological thrillers. Thrillers with a political and science fiction tinted theme. This movie was actually the first non-manga piece of media I was exposed to of Pat Labor, and I think I saw it at the exact right time. Why? Why do you ask? Oh, just wondering. I was just curious, that's all. Alphonse is always in top condition. Mr. Sakaki and everyone else in maintenance does such a great job taking care of him. He always does exactly what I ask him to do. He works just fine. He's not going to go berserk! Pat Labor is a mecha anime that actually cares about its human characters, which is something a lot of modern stuff will sort of fall flat with. And I'm not just talking about with anime, the same thing can be said about The Simpsons, a show that occupied the same time frame that Pat Labor did, and outlasted it by multiple decades to become a completely different show in the end. By showing your comedic characters are more than just a vessel to tell jokes through, you will unlock a way more interesting and multi-layered character hidden within with more interesting motivation. That's a given. While it's more subtly presented in Pat Labor, a better example of this with with just a much larger emotional punch is Anigo Montoyo. It helps you relate to the character in a more comfortable and human way to see them in a more vulnerable state. And in Pat Labor, it balances out nicely with the less serious scenes. second movie. Second movie was made and released a year after the big bubble burst, and good lord does it show. I often like to joke and say that Pat Labor 2 is just a beta test of Ghost in the Shell, but after rewatching both I can say that with confidence. Not thematically, of course, but definitely aesthetically and tonally. In fact, of the two I could argue that Pat Labor 2 is the most Oshi movie of the two, even though it's one of the lesser known, it's got religious symbolism, military technology, political existentialism, technological symbolism, long talks about philosophy. Pat Labor 2 is probably my second least favorite, mostly because it doesn't seem very Pat Labor. It takes place three years after the events of Pat Labor 1. Ota has moved on to work as a drill sergeant, Shinji is a desk cop, Asuma and Noah now work as engineers at Shinohara, Hiromi still works at SV2 as a truck driver slash farmer, and both of the captains are still working in special vehicles. Meanwhile, Captain Nagumo's past lover slash teacher is plotting a civil war. This is where all the political and philosophical themes come from for this movie. The themes of Pat Labor 2 are heavy ones, and they really parallel some of the things people might be feeling in recent times. They mostly reflect on the actions of the Japanese post war government and what is the meaning of peace. 
If it's a peace kept with foreign violence, is it worth having? Is it better to have an unjust peace or a just war? Which is something I've thought about a lot recently. If you're a fan of Hoshi's work that isn't Pat Labor, watch this one. If you're a fan of Pat Labor, I recommend you go into this movie not expecting it to be Pat Labor. The point is you gotta hit him. Close one eye, aim carefully. That's all, then you'll nail it. Well, I gotta get going. But what if a big tank's coming at me? Then what? And close your other eye as well. While the first two movies were just Oshi being Oshi, the third movie I can't really blame him for, sadly. It was actually directed by Fumihiko Takayama, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, who is famous for doing some directional work for War in the Pocket. He also directed for Bubblegum Crisis, Nadia the Secret of Blue Water, and some Macross stuff, which is all stuff I'd like to see but really haven't yet due to the fact that I don't feel really crazy interested about them. The reason I bring up Nadia though is because that gives me a very important connection to the key theme of this section of the video. You see, in 1995, the anime industry, especially the mecha anime industry, was flipped on its head, mutated by the radiation of Evangelion. It was action-packed, but character-focused and driven. Sleek and cool, but emotional and existential. Suddenly, the entire industry was changing because of this depressed tokusatsu fan and his show about haunted giant robot monsters. Honestly, this is a topic for another video I might have to do, but you guys get the idea. Mecha anime! just hit puberty baby and boy is it making people uncomfortable so what do you as a writer on a project based on a pre-evangelion ip do yeah i don't i don't i don't think this is it chief i don't like this one it reduces the characters we know from the series down to brief cameos that are almost at an easter egg level of Look Gary, there I am again! Some people probably like it. I'm not one of them. It's like it's embarrassed to be a Pat Labor movie, even if the plot is something ripped right from an episode of the original OVA. The 450 million year old trap is a love letter to old school tokusatsu. The plot is about a mad scientist who is inspired by Professor Sarazawa from Godzilla, who was experimenting with evolution and created a giant reptilian monster that he released into Tokyo Bay, and it's recently gotten old and large enough to be a problem for the people of Tokyo. Throughout the episode there's these little easter eggs and jokes that are all references to tokusatsu films, which makes it a cute little game of I Spy for the viewer to play. Now take out all of the fun that I just talked about, inject it with the fattest post-Evangelion enema you can have. Now you have... The plot of Wasted 13 is about a mad scientist who is experimenting with cancer cells to bring back her daughter and created a giant amphibian monster that she released into Tokyo Bay and now it has gotten old and large enough to be a problem for the people of Tokyo. You want to know the really funny thing about that plot description I just gave? I just copy and pasted the description from the OVA episode I typed and changed a couple of words. And again, there are people who enjoy this one. I'm not one of those people. You might be, in which case, you're wrong. But if you're a newbie to the franchise, check it out and make your own opinion. Don't listen to the opinions of a cyborg criminal on the internet. So, 
In summary, Early Days OVA. It's good, you're in for a treat. Pat Labor on TV, fantastic. Watch it if you can. Pat Labor, The New Files, a sequel OVA to the TV show. It's pretty solid, not required to enjoy the TV show, but does have some pretty fun gag episodes. Pat Labor, The Movie, best of the movies. Watch it if you can. Pat Labor, The Movie 2, good, but not a good piece of Pat Labor media. Watch it if you want. Pat Labor the Movie 3, Wicked 13. Form your own opinions on it. Watch it or don't. I... I don't give a shit. You're probably wondering... We heard you, Pat Labor is so good. Why does it have any modern reasons? To which I would reply, this body is a prison. <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, I have no clue. The series used to be pretty fucking big. Was it Wasted 13 that killed it? Possibly. Maybe it was BAM! Just kidding! They released a short back in 2016, directed by Yasuhiro Yoshira. This one seems like a return to the classic formula of giant robots antics and some serious undertones like the old series. Watching this short is actually what re-sparked my love for the series back in 2018. It actually brought a tear to my eye watching it to be honest. Other than this short, there's been some live action tokusatsu media made, but I haven't watched it because I'm afraid they might fall into the same vein as the third and second movies. There's no grounds for this fear other than the fact that they came out not too long after the third movie's release, and post-Evangelionism was still in full swing. There is also this Pat Labor Easy Y, which we don't really know anything about other than the fact that it's it's been announced and that it's being worked on. Really quick, I wanted to talk about these memes. These are both from my favorite pieces of Pat Labor media from the first movie and episode Red Labor Landing. No one knows this and I feel like I need to teach you guys about it. One of the coolest things I remember seeing as a kid was the quote at the end of every episode. Because I was watching this probably 20 years later, and you know what? Pat Labor got some shit right. Giant industrial humanoid robots were becoming a thing, and insectoid industrial robots had been a thing for a while, as well as fully automated assembly lines that had been around for decades at this point. Robots in industrial environments weren't just science fiction, and Pat Labor didn't predict giant robots, but it did predict the mundanity of their use. Maybe it wasn't in 10 years, but we knew. And to middle school Barry, that was the coolest thing about Pat Labor. To be honest, I've been dancing around talking about what happens in all pieces of media throughout the franchise, because honestly, this series is peerless to me, and I want you to watch it. Sure, Evangelion and Gundam provoke some interesting conversations about philosophy, politics, war, and science, but Pat Labor feels less like it's trying to tell a bigger story and more about what it would be like to live as a first responder or a civilian or a Japanese cop in a world where a much bigger story is happening around them. Much like how our world works, it's a slice of life, monster of the week, piece of art. And I know Oshi and Headgear probably wanted it to be bigger wanted it to be the next Gundam, which would have been cool. I love Gundam, I love Evangelion, but Pat Labor isn't that kind of show, and I'm glad it ended the way it did. <laughs>